Hey everyone back again today I want to briefly explain utilitarianism. If you want more on this I've done a whole episode that's just it's an hour long. I'll break down the whole text for you. Won't that be great? Before jumping into it, hi I'm David. I explain philosophical texts and ideas and ways to make them accessible to you. So if you're new here you can like, share, subscribe, tell your friends who knows they might love it. Who knows they might not? And then you could talk about it and, and figure out why. Won't that be fun? Yeah, do all those things. You can follow me on other platforms. If you found this on YouTube, you're gonna be able to find it. It's just a podcast on pretty much any platform under all the same names and titles and all that. Or if you found this as a podcast, you're gonna be able to find it on YouTube where sometimes there's accompanying video and you can see my wall behind me. I'd love for you to try and name all of these figures that you see behind me. If you're listening to this in podcast form, it's probably pretty strange. Give it a try. I'd love to know what you have to say. But yeah, without further ado, Let's jump into utilitarianism because I'm going to break it down for you and I'm going to describe one of Ursula K. Le Guin's beautiful short stories. I want you to tell me about it. You know, if you're a utilitarian, I'd love to know. And ask yourself, would you walk away from Omelas? And if that doesn't make sense, that's okay because I'm going to explain it. So I'm taking this from John Stuart Mill's text titled Utilitarianism. Now there are lots of other utilitarian theories, but we're gonna just draw from this one for the sake of brevity and for the sake of clarity and precision. Now, in order to understand this, just simply, utilitarianism refers to the moral thought and philosophy and way to organize society that maximizes people's happiness among the most people possible, among as many people as possible. Now, why does Mill offer this? I mean, you're probably listening and you're like, yeah, of course. I mean, isn't that what all moral systems have tried to do? Isn't that the end goal? Isn't this what unites advertisers and philosophers? I mean, they're all trying to find out what people want, what makes them happy. Well, Mill has a problem with the history of moral philosophy. And that is because in the history of moral philosophy, oftentimes people have sought to explain moral philosophy or to justify it by appealing to abstract notions of truth and justice and appealing to these otherworldly realms to under, try and understand how the world works and what people want. And Mill is just like, we gotta just focus on happiness. We just have to focus on what people want in their lives. And this, this is all we really need to try and improve people's lives. Now he uses this as a starting point for figuring out how society should be organized at all. Society should be run in such a way that it tries to maximize everybody's happiness as much as possible. Not only each person's happiness individually, but also among the most people as possible. And this happiness, he is totally clear, means a lot more than just bodily happiness or enjoyment. It includes both the body and the mind, where he says that you know, if we just focus purely on physical pleasure, for example, while that is good, it's not the recipe for sustained happiness, which is one of the key caveats that he gives us, that he believes that for people to live happily, that happiness has to not only be present, but it has to be guaranteed and sustained for a period. It can't be fleeting. That would be like, you know, if someone read utilitarian theory and they were like, oh, Candy makes people happy, or chocolate cake makes people happy. Let's give them chocolate cake every day. That is hardly going to satisfy all of the different components that make people happy, including mental satisfaction, security, bodily satisfaction and security. Eating chocolate cake every day would be great. I mean, that's fantastic, but that's only one step along the way to a true utilitarian happiness. Not to mention that might pose some negative health effects, especially if all you're eating is chocolate cake, like maybe that's not good for you or maybe it's maybe it's great for you. I don't know. Leave it up to you. But for him, that's not quite enough. It has to include many other things. So it is not individual. What he's talking about is not a roadmap for individuals to attain satisfaction or virtue or something like that. He's way beyond that. He thinks that utilitarianism is a total system. It's about maximizing as many people's at people as possible, maximizing all of their happiness. And so he's like, this can't be reduced to individual efforts. And in fact, he prescribes that in education at a young age, children need to be taught to equate their own happiness with the happiness of the greater good. And it makes sense on like a human biological level. That is, we do better if people around us are doing well. If people around you are not doing well, then you're probably not gonna be doing great. And if everybody is doing well, 
in a society and we will extend beyond this to the world, then the world will be doing better. This is, I mean, it just seems basic. We are, we are the animals that cooperate among other animals and you want everybody to be able to cooperate equally and to enjoy in the happiness that that equality offers. So this is to break away from nationalism or the belief that only like my community should be happy. The point is that it is total. It has to be a global movement. And he's, he's like, you know, this has always been present in other moral philosophies. It's always been there. People trying desperately to find out what people want, what makes them happy, what makes them tick. Like Aristotle, all the way back to Aristotle, like finding out what is virtue and him suggesting that virtue is this golden mean, the balancing act between different temperaments and, and everything else. And that was him just trying to find out what makes people happy, where he thought it was this sustained proximity to this like golden mean Whereas Mill is like, no, it's not just individual, you know? You have to include others here. You have to work together, you know? You have to maximize everybody's happiness. And so we must move beyond just the, like, oh, I just want myself or my family or my community to be happy. It's about the world. It's about everybody. We are all a part of this moral philosophy here. Now, with that being said, there are certainly problems where, and they sneak into Mill's work where he's like, yeah, the people who attain the highest level of reason are going to live the best lives. And so he really lionizes European reason and European thought as being the avenue towards true happiness and enlightenment, which is like we can do without while also acknowledging the beauty of the mind, but that this beauty assumes many different forms and many different cultures among many different people. To know that to satisfy the mind and the body are often the same thing. They often go hand in hand, but at times they don't, and that's fine. But it's important not to reduce everybody globally to just their adopting the European standard of what reason is, or what enlightenment is, what happiness is, what satisfaction is. And the last thing about utilitarianism I wanna add is that Mill is totally clear that its tenets, its precepts are gonna transform as, as societies change and people transform. There shouldn't just be one set of laws that we set up one day globally and are like, these are the utilitarian laws. No, that's not the point because world cha the world changes. These always need to be renegotiated and evaluated, but always with the greatest good and the greatest happiness in mind. That should be the basic, the basic premise for Mill to guide any future adjudication or any future meetings and, and ideas about how laws should be constructed. Now I wanna present just briefly, Ursula K. Le Guin's beautiful short story called The Ones Who Walk Away From Omelas. And after I do, tell me, would you walk away from Omelas and how does this connect with utilitarianism? In her short story, she describes this idyllic, perfect society. It's perfect in every single way. People are the happiest they've ever been. There are, there are drugs, but nobody uses them because everyone's just so satisfied in their lives. Everybody has all their needs met, except a single child underneath one of the buildings in one of the basements who is tortured endlessly and it is upon their suffering that everyone else is able to enjoy absolute amazing happiness. This is a utilitarian society that's been realized. Happiness has been maximized among the most people. Except everybody in this society at some point in their lives, when they're, I think when they turn 18 or something, they have to witness this child and acknowledge that it is because this child is suffering immeasurably, in, inhumanely. There's no, there's no way to really comprehend it. It is because this child is suffering that everyone else is able to enjoy unlimited, unbridled happiness. And then people are given the option either to stay or to leave. And it's a, an important question because it really demonstrates the limits of utilitarianism. When do we wipe our hands of any suffering if we think we've reached a point of the greatest good being achieved? Is it ever a finished product? Probably not. It's something that always needs to be evaluated and reconsidered. But let me know. Would you leave? I hope you would. But I'd really love to know what you'd have to say about it, how it connects to utilitarianism, and if you buy it at all. And yeah, on that note, if there's anything I omitted, go check out the longer episode I've done on it. It's We'll probably answer all of your questions, but anything I got wrong, I'd love to hear about it. And yeah, on that note, take care.